Okay, so this lecture we're going to talk about the left ventricle in a little bit more detail than we discussed before and uh, just kind of review some of the things that we look for in the left ventricle. So remember, you're going to be using these in clinical scenarios where the patient is hypotensive or hypoxic. Um, you're going to do all your other basic ABCs and then eventually you're going to bring your ultrasound probe out to kind of help you uh, solidify which what you think might be going on. You can also use this in cardiac arrest type situations. Uh, you don't have time for an official echocardiogram, so remember this is a point of care ultrasound where you're looking for uh, individual uh, actual uh, diagnoses that may help you at the bedside to help make a decision on the patient. When looking at causes of shock, uh, things that you can particularly look for in the left ventricle is hypovolemic, uh, where if you see a reduced end diastolic chamber and, and or kissing ventricles during systolic, you can also look for systolic failure, reduced contraction, and reduced ejection fraction. There's other lectures where we talk about pulmonary embolism and tamponade. Remember, as, we, um, as the machines get easier and easier and more handheld, you're going to have more ability to be able to uh, use this in real time while the patient is in a hypotensive state or cardiogenic shock. So again, this is just uh, one of the algorithms used, and essentially, uh, at some point, you can uh, start looking at the LV for like um, relative RV to LV size, LV uh, for hypovolemia and function. So let's talk a little bit about the pump. Things that you can look for are pericardial effusion, which we talk about in another lecture. In this one, we're going to talk about global contractility of the left ventricle. And in another lecture on right ventricle, we'll talk a little bit more about relative size of the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So remember, the squeeze of the pump, we can determine global left ventricle or function. One of the important things about point of care or bedside ultrasound is we're not trying to make uh, decisions about a lot um, about the left ventricle that we're not capable of. What we, we're trying to do is just make a rough equivalent guess on whether the function is poor, normal, or hyperdynamic. And those are the terms that you should be using in your notes, in your um, procedure note when you, when you do these ultrasounds, is that you're making a decision on the global function. So remember, we were trying to figure out why we look at the heart. Uh, remember, pulmonary edema is not only a lung diagnosis. You must uh, integrate lung in the emergent evaluation of the heart. There are a lot of uh, algorithms that have come out, race, fear, fade, and focus. These are all point-of-care cardiac ultrasounds, and I would guess there's going to be a lot more that come out over the next couple of years. But what I want to equip you with is how you evaluate the left ventricle in specific. So we talked about in previous lecture all the different routes. The most important route for a function for evaluating the left ventricle is the papillary muscle level of the peristolar short. Although you can use all the, other, uh, uh, all the other routes to be able to help solidify your answer, the papillary muscle is the one that's the most important. The American Society of Echo in the past has stated that that is one of the best places because you can guarantee that you're in the center of the left ventricle that way. Again, just to show you, the peristolar short is cut into five different areas, uh, the apical, the papillary muscle, the mitral valve, the aortic, and the pulmonary artery level. The, again, the papillary muscle level is the most important level that we're looking at. And I'll show you some clips and images of that. So remember, contractility uh, is you can actually use M mode to look at the left ventricular shortening fraction. You can actually get a fraction of that, but remember, we're not here trying to quantify. We're just trying to look at the uh, qualitative assessment of these patients. So again, we're only looking for poor, normal, or hyperdynamic. <clears throat> the diastolic dysfunction is hard to detect. Uh, you need more uh, more sophisticated methods to determine that, and it's not for you at the bedside for point of care. The left ventricular contractility is a field large in subtleties. It is preload and afterload de dependent. Uh, it depends on the cardiac window, and that's why the peristolar short papillary muscle level is the optimal one because it kind of takes a lot of guesswork out of where you are. And of course, operator experience. 
um, makes a difference. And one thing, remember, is always check the lung for B profile for bilateral suggestive of pulmonary edema. So no matter what the systolic function is, hyperdynamic or poor, if you have pulmonary edema with bilateral B lines, that suggests that the, that the heart is not able to keep up with the fluid, at least in the short term. So again, remember, you're going to be looking at the global evaluation of the heart, and you are not going to be giving an injection fraction. You're, uh, you're really just giving a, a relative. And if you think about it, poor can be anywhere pretty much between 10 and 40%. Normal is like 50 to 60 and anything above 65 is like hyperdynamic. So you're actually kind of making it even easier for you. So again, good and hyperdynamic contractility. The walls come almost all together and almost obliterate the ventricular cavity during systolic function. Uh, poor contractility, the walls move little and the heart may be dilated. Uh, anterior leaflet of the mitral valve in the peristernal lung can also be test can be also looked. In normal state, it should be touching the septum during the ventricular filling. So here's some images. So on the first top left, you're going to see normal. So here we see this is a peristernal lung. You see the mitral valve is hitting the LV wall. You see the LV has good normal volume in it. Here's the right ventricle, the left atrium, the pericardium. So now let's look at some hyperdynamic. So now you can see that the mitral valve, first of all, the patient is tachycardic, so don't let that confuse you. The, but the mitral valve is vigorously even touching the LV wall, and you can actually see the LV wall collapsing a little bit more, especially in the apical region. Remember, you actually want to be looking at it at the mid-level, but it's hard to look at it in a peristernal long view, and that's why we'll, we'll, I'm going to show you some images of the peristernal short also at the papillary muscle level. Now let's look at pore function. So here you see peristernal lung again. You see dilated left heart. You see a mitral valve that's barely functioning, or not barely functioning, but barely hitting the LV wall. And so this would indicate to you pore function of the heart, pore function of the LV. This is an interesting image of a patient we had in the neurosurgical ICU, uh, where you actually see apical ballooning this is sometimes seen in Takosubo, uh, but this, whenever, I, whenever you see apical ballooning, it should suggest to you that the patient might have poor left, left ventricular function. So again, you see the mitral valve, and there's a large amount of space between the mitral valve and the LV function. So the LV function here is probably very poor. So now let's take a look at some things in short axis. So again, here's a normal view of the left ventricle and short axis. Here you see the left ventricle. You see the papillary muscle. You see that the whole cavity has blood inside of it and is not totally obliterating. And so this is a picture of a normal LV function. Here's a patient with hyperdynamic function. Again, remember, always identify the papillary muscle first. If you don't see the papillary muscle, you might be at the apex. And if you're at the apex, you may end up overestimating uh, function because at the apex, it always looks like it's kissing ventricles or totally collapsing. So in this picture, we know that we're at the papillary muscle level and we know that the whole LV is almost obliterating. So if you have the correct scenario where you have a patient that's traumatic or sepsis and you see this with A lines all throughout the lung field, that indicates to you that the patient may require more fluids. Here's the left ventricle in poor function. So again, you see the papillary muscles. You see volume in the left ventricle. And you don't really see any collapsibility. Here's the apical ballooning. So actually what we did was we took the apex, we took the short axis and actually moved towards the apex and normally the apex is only this small, but you can actually see part of the apex is actually ballooning out. And so this is apical ballooning and uh, just something that we, we've seen a few times now. So you might ask, can you do this? Remember, there have been multiple studies that showed that 
Emergency medicine physicians and critical care physicians can look at this at the bedside for point of care. Remember, we're not trying to make decisions on um, mitral regurg or tricuspid regurg. We're just looking at overall function. So they said that estimation of the LV contractility is similar to cardiologists and radiologists, other people reading echoes. Identification of cardiogenic shock can lead to earlier revascularization. We see a lot of sepsis and a lot of hypovolemia, so you can get really good with this. But I would say the most important thing that we can contribute to our patient is repeated evaluations. We can, we can repeat these evaluations after we give our fluid bolus, after we give our Lasix, after we give our inotropic agent. And if we make the wrong decision, we can know that immediately. And we can use the ultrasound to help us correct the patient's course much earlier than we could before. So remember, you can't have other <coughs> causes of hypotension. You can have segmental wall motion abnormalities. You can have valvular diseases. Um, you can have intracavitary thrombosis and tumors that kind of block the LV outflow. We have seen that a few times. You can use intracavitary devices such as PA catheters, ECMOs. And the role is to actually rule out stuff previously reviewed in this lecture. But remember, remember to look at the lungs. People always forget that. The B line's bilateral with lung sliding versus A line's bilateral. Even if you have a patient with poor heart function but has no B lines on the lung, they may, if their patient is hypotensive, you may require just a small amounts of fluid, maybe 250 or 500 mils of fluid, as this, at the same time that you start your inotropic agent. Um, but sometimes that may help more than what you think. And, and now you have the ability to look at the lungs to see if you have pulmonary edema. So here, again, is another image of poor heart function. You see the left atrium. This is a peristernal lung. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. This is the mitral valve and the aortic valve. You see a large dilated left ventricle. You do not see the mitral valve touching the LV. And so this would indicate to you poor function. Here's another patient with hyperdynamic. So this, this one, you can actually see both papillary muscles, which is what you actually want. And you can see that the function is really uh, strong. It's, and you, if the patient is hypotensive, you may need to give some more fluid. You actually have a little bit thick wall also. Here's a subcostal evaluation. This is actually a normal heart. You can see normal twisting of the heart. You have the parasonal muscles. You have a good amount of LV volume. This would be like a good normal. Here's to show you some apical, apical views. So essentially, this is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. The reason we know that is because the tricuspid valve inserts just a little bit closer to the, the probe. So this is the apex and this is the probe. And uh, the tricuspid valve always inserts a little bit higher. Refer back to the basic lecture. I discussed that a little bit more. Um, so we know this is the left ventricle. And this actually looks like OK function. Here's the hyperdynamic heart. Now remember, if you don't have the mitral valve and the aortic valve in the same plane for personal lung, you may not be directly in the center. And you can overestimate function. Although this is probably a good image, since you have both of these. And try not to make conclusions in parasonal long view until you see the mitral valve and the aortic valve in the same plane. Here's a short axis view of someone with poor function. Here's papillary muscles. Here's the LV. And you see the function is uh, definitely not, definitely the LV is not collapsing fully. Here's a patient that probably is at the apex, we don't see great papillary muscles. And so I wanted to show you, don't get tricked by thinking that this is good function because you're only looking at the apex. I want you to remember to be able to identify the papillary muscles. So here's a final to close out the slide. This is a good normal. Again, you see papillary muscles, short axis view of the left ventricle. So remember, you're looking for good hyperdynamic contractility, poor contractility. 
you can look at short axis, long axis, but short axis papillary muscle level is preferred. And don't forget to look at the lungs. That's probably one of the same most important things. And you can also look at the inferior vena cava. You can take CVP. You can take all these things into the account and use, essentially use your LV function as a crutch uh, and as just one component of the full evaluation of what you're making. All right, thanks a lot.